Ready? Um, sure. All right, cool. I'm going to introduce you first. So, yeah, um, everyone, it's my pleasure to um, introduce Chris and I'm sorry, Anger, <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> um, who uh, is doing work that I think is really right at the intersection of cognitive science and computer science. So, um, uh, then you know, a perfect sort of candidate for what we try to achieve in in the seminar series. So she got her PhD. Um, at MIT, I think we overlapped very slightly while we were there, um, uh, and then she went on to a uh, postdoc at Harvard Medical School and then York, um, uh, and yes, yeah, she basically, well, you'll hear all about it, but is sort of um, uh, using what we know about human vision processing um, uh, to inspire um, computer vision models, from what I understand. So take it, you can go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a way I can share my screen? To um, do slides? So, yeah, so share screen, that little, there should be a green button down there, share screen. Do you see that on your uh, Zoom? I think I'm not, oh, I do have it, so I just had a weird view. Yeah, cool. Cool. All right, so yeah, thank you for that introduction. Um, I do study the intersection of human and computer vision, and today I'll be talking about some of my work trying to model human visual search using features that we've taken from uh, computer vision, specifically from deep convolutional neural networks. Uh, so the interesting thing about human vision is that to understand a scene, you really need to look around it. So if I ask you, do you see any people in the scene? You're going to have to move your eyes through this image, look at different locations to try to decide if you see a person. Uh, and in fact, I've done this experiment in the lab, so I know that when people explore this image to try to find people, they mostly look at these locations. And so a big focus of my work is trying to understand why do people look in these locations? Um, where do you look? Why do you look there? What are the features that are guiding your search for these particular targets? Um, so there's a bunch of different uh, sources of attentional guidance that I've studied. And today I'll really be focusing on guidance by the appearance of a target. So if I ask you to look for people in an image, you know, you kind of know where people should appear, probably on the sidewalk, not so much in the sky. Um, you know, your eye might be drawn to some salient features like the bright colors. Um, but in particular, you're looking for things that look like a person, you know, tall figures, uh, things that have the shape of a person. Um, so that's what I've been focusing on modeling recently. And um, particularly interested in modeling that because this is critical for a lot of real world uh, visual tasks. So it's interesting from a cognitive standpoint. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, just a sec. <laughs> it's interesting from a cognitive standpoint to know why you'd look in certain locations, but it's also interesting for certain tasks. So, um, you know, when people are trying to pay attention while driving, what are the things that are gonna capture your attention? If you're doing a specialist task, like trying to find uh, you know, certain military objects in satellite images or trying to find cancer in a medical scan. You know, how do people actually search for these critical targets? Um, and these are critical tasks because, you know, when searching for targets in a medical image, lives actually depend on getting these searches correct. So um, today I'm going to talk, uh, first off, introducing visual search, uh, kinds of features guide attention. And then I'll talk about some of my work modeling uh, more complex aspects of visual search. So that's search for targets that are defined by their shape and search for targets when you don't actually know what targets in the image and you have to sort of keep multiple targets in mind. I'll wrap it up by talking a little bit about how I'm trying to take this uh, cognitive approach back to natural images and actually model visual search in natural images. Uh, and finally, a conclusion. Um, so if you would indulge me by uh, Unmuting your mics, I'm going to do a quick little visual search experiment. So I'm going to show you a target, and when you find the target in the image, just you know, clap or snap your fingers or make a noise so that we can get a nice sort of auditory distribution of the reaction times. Um, so see if you can find this red square in the image. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Hopefully people found that pretty easy. Um, okay, see if you can find this circle in the image. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Cool, pretty easy. Okay, one more try. Um, see if you can find this number five in the image. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. people do find it, but it, it takes a little bit longer yeah. than just looking for that circle. Uh, awesome, thank you guys. Um, so 
th this is the basic idea of visual search. Um, some tasks are pretty easy, some tasks are a lot more difficult. And that search efficiency seems to depend on the target distractor contrast. Um, so some contrasts are easier than others. You try to find the red among the sort of bluish colors, that's pretty easy. You try to find a circle among these kind of square shapes, that's pretty easy. But when I ask you to try to find the five among the two, exactly the same shapes, just mirror images, that's pretty difficult. Um, so a lot of visual search uh, literature focuses on trying to understand what makes some tasks easier and some hard. Uh, and the other thing that's important to note is that some tasks uh, start out easy when you have a few uh, distractors and stay easy no matter how many distractors you have. So that's things like trying to find the, the red among the blue or any kind of color contrast. Uh, and that's shown here if you've got just a few distractors, trying to find the red is easy. As you add more distractors, stays pretty easy. Other tasks get much, much harder as you start making the search display more complicated. Um, so for example, if you're not just trying to find a color, but a color plus an orientation, so that's a conjunction of two different features, you know, it's a little bit harder when you have a few distractors, but as you add more distractors, it becomes much, much harder. Uh, and then finally, even more complex search tasks, like trying to find a letter T among randomly rotated letter Ls, that, that becomes even worse. So the more distractors you add, the slower or the harder that search task becomes. So we measure a lot of um, search tasks by search efficiency or the search slope. So that's how much slower does this task become as you add more and more distractors. I guess another thing you can notice in this example is that saying that a, D, a target is not present tends to always be slower than saying it is present, just because you know, on average you can find it after searching half of the display. Um, so we're really interested in these search slopes. And uh, you know, some models of visual search would say that search tasks basically fall into two categories. You have the super simple tasks, the ones that never become harder as you add more distractors, and then you have the harder tasks that do become harder with more distractors. Um, that's probably an oversimplistic approach, but the general idea holds that um, certain features are very easy to extract early in vision, other features are more difficult, uh, and sort of conjunctions of features are more difficult than individual features, complex, uh, you know, like semantic features would be more difficult than kind of basic features like color or orientation. This is just an example of a very influential model, which is the feature integration theory by Treisman and Galata. The idea being that these very simple basic features can be processed in parallel across the whole visual field. But if you want to compute a more complex feature like recognizing a T uh, as versus just a vertical and a horizontal line, that requires more attention. You know, maybe you even have to make an eye movement to that location to decide whether that's a T or not. So there's been a lot of great research looking at what are these basic features that can guide attention? And what's the difference between the, the sort of pre-attentive features that don't require attention and the more complex features that might require you to actually make an eye movement or fixation to recognize that feature. Uh, here's some examples from a talk by Jeremy Wolf. So it's kind of going from the most basic features to the less basic features, the ones that produce very fast search to the very slow search. Uh, so on the fast side, you've got things like edge orientation, curvature, or the size of a target. Uh, if your target is distinguished by its size or it's the only thing that has corners, it's going to just pop out of the display no matter how many distractors you have. Um, but if you're looking for a target like in the lower left, which is a particular shape, like a particular conjunction of edges, trying to find that perfect cross among the sort of weirder shapes, that doesn't pop out. You basically have to serially search the display to try to find that item. Or if you're trying to find a target that's defined by a conjunction of parts, uh, like red on the left and blue on the right, that's not going to pop out. And finally, if your target is defined by something more complex, like its semantic category, try to find the only number in that display of letters, try to find the one upside down face in the display of faces. These are very complex features that distinguish the targets versus distractors. So these don't pop out at all. Uh, you really have to slowly, serially search the display to find your target. Um, so it, yeah, there's been tons of work trying to identify these pre-attentive, basic, parallel processing features. You know, we've identified a whole lot of different ones. You know, and since I'm interested in object shapes, some of the shape ones are things like the closure of a shape, if it's an actual solid contour, or if you know, it's an open line, uh, curvature, presence of corners. These are all kind of pre-attentive parallel features that seem to make a target just pop out of the display. Um, but trying to exhaustively list all these features is pretty difficult. And we have to come up with these features ourselves and then run experiments to show that they do or don't pop out of the display. Yeah, and trying to break down a really complex 
uh, contrast can be difficult. You know, so if I ask you to search for the pedestrian in that natural image, you know, what is the basic feature that defines a pedestrian? Or what is the conjunction of features that you're searching for? It's probably something about orientation, something about shape and curvature and color, uh, but it, it's not simple. And it's not simple for us to just break down those features and run experiments to test every single one. Um, so a slightly different approach is to say, well, you know, the features that are guiding visual attention are kind of just the features that we're using for general vision. You know, we recognize objects and scenes, we identify a pedestrian, a car, a house, et cetera. You know, whatever features we're using to do that object recognition task, those are probably the features that we need to, you know, discriminate or you, we need to have a contrast in, in order to detect the target quickly from the distractors. Um, so a slightly different approach to looking at visual search is to just apply some model of early visual processing and see if it predicts search performance. Uh, so again, there's a long history of doing this. Um, Rao and colleagues has a fairly influential model where they used early visual kind of texture-like representations to represent a whole image and determined, you know, what would be the model of a target in that sort of texture-like representation, determine where you might look to search for that target. Uh, similarly, Itty's lab has produced a number of saliency models, which are based on models of early visual processing. Uh, and more recently, Rosenholtz and colleagues uh, produced a model which is based on a, a model of visual crowding. So a model of how, what they think the representation looks like in peripheral vision that predicts where you might look for targets or how easily you might be able to detect a target in your peripheral visual field. Um, so I'll show an example of that last one. So again, if you want to try to do this like uh, the original experiment, please look at the dot in the center. Uh, and then I'll ask you how many people are in the image. So keep fixating on the dot and see if you can count the people in your peripheral vision. So hopefully you can see that there are some people, or you might guess that there are some people. If you want to look around, um, I think there are probably six people in the image. And looking, you know, peripherally, you know, you probably could guess there were two, four, something in that range, but I, you probably couldn't count every individual one very easily. And that's because the representation in peripheral vision is, is kind of crowded. Uh, you know, your ability to see things in the periphery is not that great, and that's why you make eye movements. Uh, so this is an example of the Rosenholtz model of peripheral vision. Uh, so we think that in the periphery, features are kind of crowded. The, Spatial precision of the features isn't that great. They get kind of jumbled together. So you have kind of a texture-like representation. You can sort of see if there's vertical lines or horizontal lines. You can see if there's bright or dark colors. You can see what the color contrast is. But you can't really exactly place any of these features in the right location. And it gets a little difficult to build more complex features. Um, so this seems like a promising model to explain visual search because it you know, sort of predicts that the easier you could discriminate a target and distractor in your periphery, the easier it should be to search and the more it should just pop out. Uh, and in fact, Rosenholtz and colleagues showed that this was the case. This is an excellent model for predicting visual search. Um, so in their experiment, they've got a few different search tasks on the left there. So, you know, at the top, the task is to find a slanted line among the vertical. Uh, the next one, B, is to find a conjunction of, I think, white and vertical among the distractors, and finally a, a T versus L search at the bottom. What they did was that they uh, represented the basic features of these patches, the target present and the target absent patch, uh, and re-rendered them using this uh, peripheral vision model. So in the right-hand side of this display, these are patches representing how we think the, the target present and target absent displays might look in your peripheral vision. So again, the features are getting a little bit jumbled up, but some of the critical elements are still there. So like on the top, you know, the slanted line, the diagonal line is not really in the right position, not where it was in the original patch, but it's still present if it's present. And in the cases where it wasn't present when it's absent, you, know, you can see that there's just vertical lines and there's no diagonal. Yeah, and because these features are getting a little bit jumbled up, you know, as the representation of the target and the distractor gets more complex, there's more chance for them to kind of you know, interchange features uh, and for the representation to get a little more confused. So if you look at the bottom, the, the crowding-based model, whether the T is present or absent, you know, it predicts a patch that's full of vertical and horizontal lines, but they're not well associated with the others, and it's really hard to tell which set of patches originally had the T and which set of patches originally didn't have a T. Um, 
So Rosenholtz and colleagues looked at this extensively through a lot of different search tasks and found that in general, this peripheral crowding model is actually a really good model to predict the difficulty of visual search. Um, so my work is kind of using a similar approach, uh, but instead of using their model, um, we're using deep convolutional neural networks as a sort of proxy model for this early visual or, or maybe peripheral visual processing. Um, so this is a model of the human visual system. So you see an image, I, you know, it's processed first in the primary visual cortex, relatively small receptive fields detecting relatively simple features. And as the processing goes through the whole visual system, you know, simple features are combined to make more and more complex features in a kind of hierarchical way. And the CNNs do something similar. So these are computer vision models, which again, take an image, process it in very small receptive fields, getting very simple features, like edges and colors, uh, and then pass it to another layer, which takes those outputs, builds slightly more complex features, and proceeds through many, many layers, and then eventually gives you an output, which tends to be a, a label, you know, saying that this is a picture of a face. Um, you know, this processing hierarchy is similar to what the human visual system does. That doesn't mean that it, it gives a similar result or that it's actually doing exactly what human vision does. Um, in fact, I'd be the first to admit that in many ways, these models do not see the world the way humans do. Uh, they have all kinds of bizarre behaviors. Um, you know, they're very sensitive to adversarial images. You can make very small changes in an image and the model will be completely confused. Um, an interesting result is shown here. If you show the image in the middle to a model, that's a cat. You know, very easy for the model to recognize that as a cat. If you show the image on the left, that is a close-up of an elephant. Again, models are very good at saying that's an elephant. If you blend the two together, sort of map the elephant's texture onto the cat, uh, models still think that's an elephant, even though people would tend to see that as a cat. Um, another thing that we've noticed in these models is that they're pretty robust to image scrambling. So on the left, we've got some original images and the middle is uh, texturized images, not unlike the, the Rosenholtz texturization approach. We just take some elements of the image and kind of scramble them up. Um, humans find it very difficult to recognize the objects in the image once you do the scrambling, uh, but the models aren't really that affected. The performance might drop from 90% to about 80%. So that's, that's again, not a very human-like approach to seeing the image, um, but maybe that's not a problem if we're mostly looking at visual search. These models don't see the world like humans do, but they do kind of actually seem to see the world a little bit like our models of pre-attentive or peripheral vision. Um, so we think they might provide a useful feature representation for models of visual search. And one particular area where I flipped at that is trying to predict how people search for shapes. So just like other features like texture, you know, shape is a very basic, very salient guiding feature for search. Uh, for example, the searching for the, the round object among objects that have corners, that's a very, very easy search. You know, as the shapes of the objects get more similar, like the five versus the two, like these two different types of stars, that's a much more difficult search. Um, so the question is, what exactly is it about that shape representation that makes the search easier or difficult? And again, the classic approach is to try to break down the shape into basic or elemental features and then test each of these features and see which ones cause a pop-out search. So for example, if the shape is closed, that tends to be salient, that tends to pop out. So that might be a basic feature of the shape. Uh, similarly, if the shape has a symmetric relation, that tends to pop out. So that could also be a basic feature of shape. Um, but shapes are complex. So trying to you know, exhaustively list all of these different possible features is probably not a feasible approach. So we took a different approach, which was trying to use machine learning to generate really easy or really hard distractors for a shape target and then see what, you know, what makes those different. And we do that using this CNN feature approach. So we take a basic CNN that's been trained on a very large image data set as uh, so that's ImageNet, which is a thousand object categories. It takes this input image, it goes through those series of convolutions to build the hierarchical features. And then finally at an output layer, it will give you the, the category of that image. Um, we ran the same model on our stimuli. I'll explain a little bit more what these stimuli are in a bit. Uh, put the stimuli through the same series of convolutions. Um, we don't really want the output label 
of an object because this is just a, an abstract shape. It doesn't have a real label. Um, but instead, what we do is we just take the, the second to last layer of this network before it gives you a classification label. We use that as kind of a, a feature description of the image. So it's a rather long vector. Um, and that's our, our shape descriptor, our no set of numbers to describe the shape. Um, to check whether this is giving a good result, you can give the model some example shapes and see what it thinks are similar. So on the left here are some query shapes that we showed to the model, and on the right are the most similar shapes in this feature vector representation. Um, these are abstract shapes. I guess it's a little difficult to decide if these are good or bad results. Um, for comparison, these are some similar shapes according to a, a simpler model. I would say these are slightly worse than the CNN results, um, but again, these are abstract shapes, so it's a bit of a judgment call. Uh, we did test this with a lot of different shapes and even with real objects. So um, these are examples of silhouettes of real objects. If you give it a, a type of object like a trowel, it tends to find objects that I would say are pretty similar shapes. Um, this is a potted plant. Again, it tends to find objects that are pots or vases or kettles or something kind of similar. Uh, so it seems like a promising representation for human understanding of object shape. So we used this in an experiment to generate the easier hard distractors for a search target. In this experiment, we had eight participants searching for a target shape, which was either the rabbit or the butterfly, over a series of blocks. Their task was to just click on that target. It was present on 100% of the trials. And the structures were random radial frequency patterns, so kind of those blobby shapes that I showed in the first example. And we chose those because it's easy to generate a huge number of completely arbitrary shapes in the radial frequency pattern space. It does a reasonably good job of spanning the space of possible closed shapes. And it is guaranteed to be a closed shape. Um, so the task would be to find this rabbit. And you'd see it in display like this. And hopefully it's pretty easy to spot the rabbit. Um, so that would be kind of a first, first block of the experiment. But after each block of the experiment with uh, random sets of distractors, we would take the three easiest or harders, hardest distractors and average their CNN shape vectors to try to find sort of the, the center of mass of what makes the search hard or difficult. So, or sorry, easy or hard. So if we wanted to make the search task really, really difficult, you know, we'd show you 20 different uh, search displays, 20 different distractors. You're always trying to find the rabbit. And at the end of that, we'd figure out the, the three that were the slowest search and uh, find the center of mass of those distractors, shape vectors in the CNN feature space. Um, so we centered a Gaussian distribution uh, around the hardest distractors and then sampled from that distribution to get a new set of distractors. Uh, and in the final block, we reran the overall easiest or hardest distractors just to get a baseline understanding of how hard or easy those, those uh, distractors actually were. Um, so after many, many blocks of distractors, you might be asked to find this target and you'd see it among distractors like this. So hopefully that's a little bit harder than the first example. Uh, so these are some results. On the left, the bottom left is the search times of the final block. So in the final block, we showed this target, people search for this target among the distractors that we had uh, using machine learning selected to be very, very easy or selected to be very, very hard. Um, so the blue line is the easy, and you can see that that's a classic easy search, almost completely flat, regardless of the number of distractors. And the red line is the hard distractors, and that's, again, kind of a classic hard search. The difficulty increases uh, as the number of distractors increases. And the distractors themselves are shown in the pink and blue squares. Uh, so in the hard case, we got distractors that don't really look like rabbits, but maybe have some of the same features as rabbits. So they have sort of a central blob, and they have a couple of smaller blobs that could potentially be ears. Uh, and the easy distractors are the distractors that, in theory, shouldn't have any features of the shape of a rabbit. Um, so they've got lots of small blobs, or they're just a single, uh, you know, sort of shapeless circle. Um, the search for the butterfly was not quite as successful. So if you look at the lower left, those are the reaction times. Again, the easy search is pretty easy. It's very flat slope. 
the hard search wasn't super hard. Um, so even after training the distractors to be difficult, the, the search slope was not, I mean, it was a little bit harder than the easy search, but it, it wasn't that hard. Um, and you can also see that the distractors don't look probably as much like the target in the hard case. Um, there's nothing that really looks like a butterfly or has a symmetrical shape of a butterfly. The easy distractors definitely do not look like butterflies, though. Uh, we can also show how this uh, training worked in the CNN feature space. So what I'm showing here is um, a PCA of the feature space. So these three axes are, um, actually the CNN features are high dimensional. These are just three dimensions of that high dimensional space that do a good job kind of showing you where the points are. The open circle is the target where that's located in that feature space. And the red and blue dots are the hard and the easy distractors. Um, so the thing to notice here is that the red dots are a lot closer to the target, that open circle, and the blue dots are farther away. So this kind of intuitively makes sense if you want to make distractors that make a search really hard, make it really, really hard to find the shape target, they should be kind of similar to the target. Um, and we didn't you know, try to select distractors that were close to the target, we just let the algorithm choose what distractors it, it wanted to select. Um, and this is the same results for the butterfly. Uh, and here, again, you can see that the hard distractors are a bit closer to the butterfly, but they're not actually that close to the target, which I think is one reason this experiment didn't work as well, is that we were never able to evolve distractors that were very similar to that butterfly target. Um, so the, the overall results is that this target distractor similar, similarity in the CNN feature space seems to be a pretty good predictor of search efficiency. If you have the same CNN features as a target, you're going to be a very hard distractor, make it very, very difficult to find that target. If you have extremely different CNN features, that should be a very easy distractor that makes it very easy to find that target. Um, the distractors don't really look like the target, but they have some similar features or similar parts. Uh, and actually, in some follow-up work, we looked in more detail at whether search is actually guided by that global shape or guided by the individual parts. So this was work by a student in Jeremy's Wolf, Jeremy Wolf's lab. Uh, again, we had people searching for this rabbit distractor, and we either showed them these uh, original hard distractors. These are from a slightly different uh, machine learning process, but they gave kind of similar hard distractors, or a subset where we added more parts. So we noticed that the hard distractors tended to be blobs with ears, so we just added a lot more ears to the blobs to see if that would guide visual search. Um, it actually doesn't. Uh, so the results here, the red lines are the original hard distractors, and the blue lines are when you add a lot more ears to the distractor. Um, adding more ears doesn't make the search more difficult. The blue lines are mostly below the red. In fact, if anything, it seems to make the search easier. Um, so the conclusion is that it, it looks like the global shape is guiding search, um, and we can use similarity in CNN feature space as a proxy for whatever the perceptual similarity is between the target shape and the distractor shape. Um, and it seems to represent the global or holistic shape more than the individual parts. Um, and the, the spatial arrangement of the parts probably aren't super important. It's just the presence of the parts in this kind of, uh, yeah, high dimensional feature representation. Um, so that's one example of trying to represent a more complex aspect of search. Uh, another thing that I've looked at is how do you search for targets when you have multiple targets and you don't really know which target is going to appear on a given trial. Um, so this is something that has been referred to as hybrid visual memory search. So in this task, the search target could be any of M items that you've memorized in advance. And the task is to search for that uh, target among some N distractors. Uh, this was first described by Jeremy Wolf in 2012. So for example, suppose you have to search for one of these two targets, either a car or a rhinoceros, you have no idea which, which one is going to show up on a given trial. Um, so do either of these appear in this display? Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully you can see that the rhinoceros is there. Um, this is a little bit more complicated than searching for one individual target, but hopefully you didn't find it too complicated. It's just two targets. Um, the, 
results are kind of what you would expect. So on the left, uh, this is the increase in difficulty with visual set size. Um, so the pink line is if you have to search for just one target, the red is two, the blue is 16. The more targets we add, the harder the search. Um, the right-hand side is showing how this increases with the memory set size. So it's not the case that adding two targets makes the search take, take twice as long, four is four times as long, 16 is 16 times as long. It actually increases not quite as quickly. Um, so these are not straight lines increasing with the memory set size, these are curved lines. Uh, in fact, they're logarithmic increases with uh, the memory set size. So we've got overall search time seems to increase as a linear function of the visual set size. That's what I showed earlier with the very efficient versus inefficient search. Um, but it's not a linear set function of the memory set size. It's actually a logarithmic function of memory set. Uh, so one thing we can say is this is not M independent searches. People aren't searching two times for the two different targets or four times for four targets. They're doing something a lot more efficient. Um, and when you see a logarithmic increase like that, you might think that they're doing something kind of efficient in a feature space. So maybe the similarity of the targets actually matters. If we gave them a task where we ask you to search for a car, you know the structures aren't going to be cars. You could think of that as a really, really hard hybrid memory search where you, know, you have to search for any of n possible car models in any of m possible colors, and they could also be any pose. You don't know, you know what pose the car is going to be in. Um, so you know, it could be a potentially a 10,000 memory set size search, but surely people don't do that. Like we know search for category member is not that inefficient. Uh, so this was studied by Cunningham and Wolf, uh, individual categories versus individual objects. And um, this is a bit of a complex graph, but the solid lines are showing search for different numbers of categories, and the dotted lines are searches for different numbers of objects. Um, so if you search for one category, which is the light gray line, that's about as efficient as searching for four different objects, even though a category could potentially have way more than four different possible appearances. Um, so there's definitely an additional efficiency here. There's some kind of compression that you can do in your search that makes it much easier to search for a category member, member than to search for just four completely, or sorry, eight completely unrelated objects. Um, so this kind of makes us think that search efficiency might depend on how well the set of targets could be separated from the set of all possible distractors in some feature space. Uh, so for example, searching for one category is not much more difficult than searching for four completely unrelated objects. Um, question is, what, that, what is that feature space? Uh, and so maybe we can use these CNN features to represent this problem and try to get a handle on what people are actually doing. Uh, so for this experiment, we use stimuli from the Hemera object data set, which are the examples I showed before. Uh, we had 10 observers, and the task was always to search for 16, any of 16 possible targets. So on a given trial, you have no idea which of the 16 could appear. Uh, and in fact, the trials were half present, half absent. So there was a 50-50 chance of having one of those 16 objects on a given trial. There were six different memory conditions which were blocked. So at the start of the block, you'd be shown your set of 16 objects, you'd had to memorize them, and then you would search through a whole series of search trials with visual sets size varying from four to 16. Um, and the six different blocks were designed to have different properties in terms of the, the similarity or the distribution of these targets in the CNN feature space. Um, so again, as our feature space, we're using one of these deep neural networks. Uh, we're just showing it the Hemera object, and again, taking out the responses of the last layer as our feature representation of the object. And again, this is a high dimensional vector, you know, representing some high level aspects of the shape, color, et cetera, of the, the object. To build these target sets, um, we PCA that representation down to uh, 16 dimensions. So this is, is again showing the PCA top three dimensions on the left. The Hemera objects kind of just make a blob in this feature space. Uh, so it's a high dimensional sort of hypersphere. Uh, and then we take the first few dimensions and try to find objects that are very similar to each other or very, very different. Um, so this is kind of a low dimensional visual representation of what we were doing. On the, the left, it, I'm showing some high similarity objects. So to get high sim similarity objects, basically we pick a point kind of on the edge of that blob in feature space and just find all the near neighbors of our sample. 
So the object in the upper left is actually the, the starting point, and then the other 15 objects are its near neighbors. So we started with a little gecko, and the near neighbors are mostly lizards, but also just some things that have kind of similar shapes and colors, like a piece of rope, and I guess a knife, and maybe a trumpet or something. Um, to get the least similar objects, we started on one part of the space and then found the points farthest away on the other sides of the space. Uh, so it gets a high dimensional space, so it's a little bit hard to draw, but if you think of it in three dimensions, it's like the, the four points of a, a four-sided pyramid. And so that's what's shown on the right. Uh, again, start from some sample object, um, which is actually a person. I, I, we later removed the people from the data set, but this is an old example. Uh, and then the other 15 objects are supposed to be just as different as possible in CNN features from that sample. Uh, so we can do this a whole bunch of different ways. So we ranged from completely coherent feature sets consisting of just one part of that CNN feature space up to sets that were you know, completely separate along the 16 dimensions and anywhere in between. So we can pick two opposite points and eight samples around each of those points. We could pick four opposite points, get four samples around those points. Um, so we've got a whole range from maximum similarity down to minimum similarity. And the question is, how does this impact search times? Well, these are the results. Um, so these are search times over visual set size with memory set size shown in different colors. And for comparison, the Wolf 2012 experiment is shown with the Xs. So if the similarity has no effect, every single one of these experiments should look like the red line, which is our 16 independent objects. The 16 independent objects basically replicated the, the search slope of Wolf 2012. So the Wolf 2012, he used 16 completely random objects. These were 16 objects selected to be different, but basically gave the same search times. But all the other memory sets actually gave faster search. So even though they were still 16 objects, people seemed to treat them as less than 16 objects. So for example, the simplest, uh, the most similar set was the 16 objects that were all near neighbors. That's the dark blue line. And that search was similar to looking to for four independent objects. So even though it was 16 objects, people seem to treat it like four. Uh, and I might also add that that is about the same as the Cunningham and Wolf study for one category. So the 16 highly similar objects kind of have the same search performance as just one category or four separate objects. So in general, it looks like higher similarity in the target set leads to faster search. Um, so you have dissimilar objects or random objects, you have a fairly slow search, but if you can make the objects more similar or if they're all from the same category, you do seem to get faster search. Um, in general, searching for the sets was a little bit less efficient than searching for the individual objects. So, you know, we had two sets of eight. That was not quite as fast as searching for just two independent objects. Um, it's a little bit slower, but it, it was faster than searching for 16 completely independent objects. Something that you should note is that the visual and semantic sim similarity was not at all controlled in this experiment. So we don't really know to what extent the efficiency is because the objects were you know, the same category, same type of thing. They were all lizards or they were all furniture. Um, or whether this is actually just due to the visual similarity, regardless of whether the objects were the same category. Um, but overall, it looks like the similarity in the CNN feature space, it does predict the efficiency of these multi-target searches. Um, and this is kind of cool because I think it opens up the door to further re research questions like, you know, are, is this increase in efficiency happening on the memory side or is it more on the visual search side? Is it mostly due to the semantic similarity or is it mostly due to the visual similarity? So we could actually independent, we could independently vary these with the CNN features. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, all this work has been looking at um, kind of artificial search tasks, individual objects, individual shapes, and these artificial displays. I uh, want to bring it back a little bit to actually modeling search in natural images. Could we use the same model to answer that question of where you look in a real image? Um, so ideally, we'd like to be able to show you an image like this and run some kind of feature model over the whole image and say, okay, if you're looking for pedestrians, these are the places you should look. If you're looking for cars, these are the places that people would look. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but uh, you know, I, th I think it's, you could imagine how to do this with a similar approach. You know, you'd go over patches of the, of the image 
and for individual sections of the image, you could say, well, okay, in this sort of CNN feature space, pedestrian should be this easy to detect. This patch looks like a pedestrian. This patch doesn't look like a pedestrian. You could build a model of, you know, where people should look in this task. Um, a full model would be a little bit more complex than the, the kind of simple experiments I've been describing, because we also need to think about how this detectability changes over eccentricity. You know, in the experiments, we kind of assumed that the feature representation was similar to all eccentricities, but it probably isn't. You know, the feature crowding, you know, we know gets worse in the farther periphery. That could definitely lead to a different representation, a shape or an object. Um, and of course, a full model would also take into account the decision-making factors. So, you know, as you're making multiple fixations into a scene, you're actually building up a mental model of what's in the scene, where the object could be in the scene. You need to integrate that existing information with your upcoming searches and optimize your choice of the next fixation location. Um, so it's a bit complicated, but um, actually a student of mine has been working on this for the past year, and we just got accepted at NIPS, or NURIPS. Um, so she has been developing a, a model of how detectability should change with eccentricity and how detectable different targets would be at different eccentricities. And so she's doing that using this kind of CNN feature approach, but actually changing the representation based on the eccentricity of the target. Um, she's shown how to, to fit those CNN results to human performance in a target detection task. And she's actually been using it to predict uh, human performance in visual search using a, a model of how to optimize the next fixation based on your, your current representation of the image and the detectability of your target. Um, so pretty excited about that. Uh, and she'll be presenting that in a couple months. And um, of course, we'd like to expand that even further. So this is looking at the you know, detectability of the target based on the target features. But we could also start talking about how you integrate that with, for example, your understanding of scene context. So you've got some understanding of where objects should appear in a scene, predictions of you know, what they should look like, how detectable they'd be in different locations. And a full model would probably integrate all of these different sources of information to build a you know, probability representation of where objects should appear and where you should look for them. Um, so the CNN features we think can be used to model detectability across the visual field. Uh, and we're hoping to use that to build more sophisticated models of visual search. So understanding what the optimal sequence of eye movements would be to locate a target, to maximize your information about what's in the scene, you know, how to compute the optimal time to quit a search. So based on detectability of targets and expected locations and probabilities, you know, when would you decide that you've searched the scene enough and that you've probably found all of the available targets or how to, to maximize your performance in a task given that you have maybe time constraints on the number or you know, numbers of targets that you're required to find. Um, so to conclude, uh, I think CNN features are a pretty good proxy for early or peripheral vision. Um, they're obviously not perfect. There are differences between these models and humans. You know, there's other feature spaces that produce you know, similar results, but the, they're reasonably good. Um, and I think the cool thing about these features is that we can use them to build more complex models, cognitive models of visual search and other visual tasks. Um, so I've shown how to use them to build models of search for shape targets, search for multiple targets, uh, and we're currently working on building models of my movement plan in, in real images. Um, and longer term, hope to take this back to some of those real world applications and design computer systems that can work more effectively with humans. So computers that understand what a human is looking for in an image, where they're looking and what they're going to miss, so that the computer can support human search and help people out with these you know, difficult and critical search tasks. Um, yeah, so finally, I'd like to acknowledge the students who were involved in this research. Um, Abigail Eisenman, who's now at UC Berkeley, worked on the shape parts experiment, and Shima Rashidi, PhD student here at the University of Melbourne, is working on the natural image search model. Um, a lot of this work was done while I was a postdoc with Jeremy Wolf, and um, currently working with Andrew Turpin and Lars Kulik at the School of Computing and Information Systems. And thank you for your attention.
Thank you, um, Chris. Everyone, everyone's showing you applause. Hopefully, yeah. Um, uh, so we've got about yeah five uh, five or ten minutes for questions. Uh, I see there's one in a chat. So maybe do we want to start with that one? Um, uh, Kevin, did you want to um, restate your question for everyone? Kevin. Um, maybe not. Kevin? Okay. Um, yeah, so anyone else, if you have a question, just sort of, um, yeah, unmute and ask. Okay, um, Amy, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thanks for the, the talk, Chris, and it um, raised, Philip Smith here, um, and it raised the interesting questions about the relationship between cognitive and neural levels of description and how you span those levels, you know, which I think is philosophically interesting. Um, one of the things which, um, and it relates to Kevin's question, that psychologists have been particularly exercised by are uh, response times, decision times, distributions of decision times. Um, does your kind of model, does your CNN model um, actually say anything about that? About, uh, you know, does it map, it gives us a description of similarity or complexity and it can predict fairly well what search tasks can be difficult versus not, uh, not difficult. But does it um, say anything directly? Is it able to predict anything directly about actual search times of humans? Yeah, I think the, the way I would investigate that would be to try to map the level of the visual system where these things are computed to you know the the cnn model so yeah, the cnn model is going through multiple layers you might say well if, if this feature contrast comes out in the first two layers that means it's maybe computed in v1 and if it comes out in the, you know, in the seventh layer that means it's in v4 um, i'd be a little hesitant to do that just because we know these models are not doing exactly what humans do so to for the most part things that appear in early layers mostly map to earlier stages of vision but it's really not one-to-one. -one. But I think that would sort of be the direction that you, you'd want to move in. And I, I also think people are, <clears throat> are currently doing that, like with other models. Cool. <laughs> I'm right. sorry, I thought the category results were particularly interesting and whether um, your, your results on you know, the equivalent of, search times for a single single category versus four objects could say anything about the kind of cognitive matching processes that are involved in matching a category and how, how, how you might model that, say, in a cognitive decision process that would predict things like decision times. Yeah, I think, I think the risk there is that you'd want to make, um, you'd want to have a, an opinion on where that's occurring. So, you know, I, I was sort of careless about blending semantic and visual similarity in the model because I kind of thought, well, you know, everything's just processed in the speed forward way. It probably doesn't matter. Um, but if you really think it's about category membership, you know, you might expect that to emerge later than something that's just looking for brown color and swirly lines and corners or something. Well, you know, there are cognitive models that you know, think about categories uh, in terms of collections of exemplars and that you retrieve a category by sort of racing exemplars, you know, this sort of Logan type description and whether, you know, something like that could apply in this situation. You know, yeah, I'm particularly <laughs> interested in response time modeling and decision time modeling. And so what I'm particularly interested in is how those sorts of results can tell us something about the matching processes that drive the decision process. Yeah, so, well, I think the, the strength of this approach is that you can start to disentangle just pure visual similarity from these other factors. Yep. Um, so if you have a model that says, you know, categories emerge through some process of matching, yeah, you can actually disentangle, well, how much of that is just due to these things having the same features you know, versus how much is it actually due to them being the same category? Is it easier to match a category if they do in fact have the same features versus categories mm. that are not so visually defined? Mm. And look, and actually while I'm asking questions, uh, just a question about you know, why your model performed poorly on the butterfly task. And it's clearly all about symmetry there, isn't it? Uh, and um, you know, so you know, there would be, all sorts of you know, gestalt principles that would say that you know we can detect symmetry. We're really good at detecting symmetry, uh, and you know, presumably that's what your model didn't have, which your human observers did. Uh, and so, you know, if, for instance, if you generated a set of distractors 
with a symmetry constraint, could you get closer? I would imagine you could. I think so. So I should be clear about that. The, the issue there is that we didn't have a pure generative model because you know, we didn't want to go the pure generative route because it was slow. So what we actually did was we had a very, very large dictionary of several million shapes for which we had pre-computed these features. And the generation process of making those shapes did not tend to make any sim, you know, symmetric shapes. It also didn't make shapes that had sharp corners like the butterfly. So I think it's more that our dictionary was lacking certain shapes as well. We never found a distractor that was very close to the target because it just didn't exist in the dictionary. But yeah, you know, a better, either a purely generative model or a better dictionary, you know, we probably could get a lot closer. So I don't, I don't think it's that the, the model doesn't understand symmetry. It actually, I think, does if you look in the features. It's just we didn't happen to have the right distractors in the set. Thank you. All right, ask a question. Uh, am I good? Yep. Um, so I was trying to, thanks Chris for a great talk. Um, I was trying to understand um, just how you were imagining the attention piece comes in here. So, so if you think um, about the, um, the kind of treesman notion, right, the idea is that those, the more complex things um, require the, this um, attentional binding in order to have the simpler features bound into, into a whole. Um, but if I'm understanding um, the way your model's working correctly, it seemed to be much more about fixation than it was about attention. And um, so I guess I'm, a, I'm trying to understand. So, so it seemed like you were still getting this complexity of, um, of the uh, things that you might have otherwise described as requiring binding. Um, but it was coming more from just the, the representational components of the of the model, as opposed to imagining that there was some kind of attention process after the fact that was that was doing the job. So I guess I'm trying to understand, you know, exactly how you see that, and because you kind of talk thing about things as as being pre-attentive, um, but still you're kind of accounting for some things that other people would have said were consequence of attention. Yeah, so I, I guess I did my PhD in the Rosenholtz lab, so I'm not sure how much I agree with the sort of attention, pre-attentive, attentive binding model. Um, yeah, obviously, you, you can recognize all sorts of things without actually making eye movement and fixating. You know, there's rapid scene perception, perception there's a rapid understanding of scene layout. Um, to a large extent, you can kind of rec represent objects or recognize objects in the periphery, not perfectly, but, you know, with some amount of error. And you're right, like the, the shape features that we're looking at are, you know, global shape features and they seem to be a little more complex than you would expect from a binding process. Um, I think it, my stance is more that you, you have this feed forward approach, you have these um, local features, they are bound into more complex features, but maybe not with perfect spatial precision. So I think you know, my impression of the shape results is that the, the features we got were kind of the same shape features in a closed shape with kind of the same global, rough global appearance, but not really the right spatial configuration. You know, the ear doesn't have to be next to the head. You can have an ear and then a body and then a head. That's a good enough rabbit for, for peripheral vision. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know how much I would attribute results to attention. I think it's, it's often hard to know exactly where somebody's attending you know, and there's differences between like attending to a location or attending to a feature or depend, you know, attending to an object. Um, and at least some of this stuff seems to just be due to the sort of poor spatial resolution of features in the periphery, kind of not perfect spatial configuration, not perfect spatial uh, association. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Awesome, so I think we have room, time for one question if it's short. Um, uh. I would have a question. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. The, you showed us a, a street scene and asked for looking out for peoples. And of course, we are primed to expect people in that environment. Uh, a vision algorithm doesn't. Um, it's agnostic to expectations. So it's not the scene somehow is is not only about where to expect what, but also what type of things to expect in an image. Uh, how much, if you would have shown me a photograph of a tabletop space and asked me to find people there, I would have laughed, nothing else. So how is that in, in your model? 
Yeah, so that's something that we're almost trying to exclude from the model because we really want to look at the guidance by target features. So, you know, if we paste a person onto that table, you know, at some point you're going to notice that they're there, even though they really shouldn't be. Um, yeah, they, these are different sources of guidance and um, some computer vision models actually are sensitive to spatial layout and um, you know, the likelihood of different objects appearing in different types of scenes. Like that's definitely something that you can build into a probabilistic model. Um, but you're right that a standard target detector usually really tries not to be aware of those just so that it can recognize targets in unexpected locations. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's a good next step for the model. Once you have a good model of the target features, you can start adding in these other sources of probabilistic guidance as well. Great. Thank you, Chris. So we're right at one o'clock. So I think we're going to have to cut that short. But that was super interesting. And um, yeah, uh, thanks for coming. And um, thank you, everyone, for attending. So, you know, yeah. Thank well, you for well, having me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thank you, Chris.